Uh, okay, so she had no significant past uh, history except she had this pituitary adenoma, which had never, you know, affected her vision. Um, and she, like, she was a bit unclear about how long the vision loss had been going on, but the best I could tell, it had been like kind of brewing for about six months. I first saw her on June 16th. She was 21, 25 in the right eye, 20, 40 in the left. Her pressures were good. Her optic nerves were very cupped. Um, and you can't see it. I don't have any disc photos. You can kind of see it in the, in the red free photos. Her right eye, especially the 20 over 125 eye, was like just completely cupped out. And the left eye wasn't much better. And, you know, I, I got a nerve fiber layer scan. And although her nerve fiber layer was pretty beat up, like you would expect, like in maybe moderately bad glaucoma, I didn't think that that explained her acuity loss. This is what her visual field looked like. Her visual field looked pretty much like glaucoma, except for the central scotoma, as you can see her foveal threshold in the more severely affected right eye is 28. And that's not terrible, but it's definitely not normal. She'd already had an MRI of her pituitary because of the adenoma. That's everybody kind of jumped to the conclusion that the adenoma had grown, uh, but it hadn't, that uh, adenoma was stable. So I made her get an MRI of her orbits uh, with contrast, which turned out to be normal. And so I thought, you know, she's got some sort of an acute optic neuropathy that's affecting her acuity on top of uh, chronic optic neuropathy, which I figured was most likely low tension glaucoma. And we, you know, we worked, I did all kinds of laboratory evaluations for vitamins and heavy metals and inflammatory markers and NMO and MOG and all kinds of stuff. I mean, her CRP was one, her sed rate was normal. Uh, and she had no symptoms of giant cell arteritis. Um, she saw Dr. Zabriskie on July 19th. I'd sent her to him for treatment of her glaucoma. Her vision had deteriorated to 20 over 300 in the right eye. Her pressures were still good. I'd started her on some drops. And Norm agreed that this doesn't just look like glaucoma. There's some sort of acute optic neuropathy on top of her low tension glaucoma that you know explains her acuity loss. Uh, he got a 10-2 that day, which he thought you know, looked like her um, uh, optic neuropathy was on the move. And the thing that bothered me was that she's now got some optic nerve swelling in the right eye. You can see, especially here in the kind of temporal superior area here, She's kind of perked up into the purple zone, whereas before that was atrophic. So I put her in the hospital and she got high dose IV steroids for, you know, a presumed inflammatory uh, optic neuropathy. Uh, Dr. Patel did a temporal artery biopsy, which turned out to be negative. And um, uh, she seemed to kind of stabilize. So she left the hospital. But then while I was on vacation, she called Norm and said, I, you know, I think I'm worse. She came back in. She deteriorated to count fingers in the right, in the right eye and 20, 100 in the left eye. Her pressures were still good. And so this time, uh, Dr. C saw her and, you know, we decided to readmit her for plasmapheresis and IVIG just because we didn't know what, what the hell else to do. Like we knew that there was something happening. We weren't quite sure what. Um, this is what her Goldman fields looked like. Um, after she got out of the hospital, you know, it kind of just looks like central scotomas um, with generalized constriction, not really a glaucomatous look, but doesn't, it didn't really fit the picture of really anything except, you know, we did entertain the thought that this was a maculopathy. And although I didn't show those things, her OCT of the macula looked pristine. We did a multifocal ERG twice, I think, that looked pristine. So we, we even though it looked like it could be a retinal problem, her retina actually looked like it was working pretty well. And then one of the diagnostic tests that I had ordered way back in June finally became available. And that showed that she had a G to A mutation at the 11778 uh, position on her mitochondrial DNA. So this is, this is a uh, uh, a pathogenic variant for labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. Now, we usually don't think about labor's hereditary optic neuropathy in 70-year-old women, but apparently it can happen. This is an atypical case. Uh, a lot of 
uh, people walk around with this mutation and never get Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. So, um, and that's kind of alluded to in the report. Um, but in this case, it, it, it did, for some reason, suddenly become uh, a case of Labor's. There, it turns out, I can't remember if it's in my notes or on my slide. Yeah, so if you do a literature search about atypical Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy, there's, um, you know, some case reports of, of women popping up, you know, in their 20s and 30s with Labor's hereditary optic neuropathy. Um, there are, there is a, just some scattered reports of people with low tension glaucoma walking around with these mutations. It's not clear if it's pathogenic in that case or just incidental. Um, uh, there's also a lot of talk in the cases that I, in the literature that I reviewed about environmental triggers. And, you know, the ones that we think about typically are alcohol and tobacco. And in, in my patient's case, she does not drink and does not smoke. Um, uh, there's also talk about, um, let's see, this is all in my notes. Uh, other triggers. Um, oh, um, antiretroviral therapy for people that, you know, either have HIV or at risk for HIV. Those can be triggers uh, for people that, care, that walk around with labor's mutations. And I think, I feel like there's one other one that I'm not remembering, but um, there, she just didn't have any of those triggers. And again, we went back through her uh, family history, no family history of blindness. Um, so I just think this is a, a very unusual case. It's really, it's, we're really lucky to have genetic testing available. Like when I, you know, when I was doing my residency, this was only available as a research test. And at least now it's commercially available, but it's still very slow to get results. And in the meantime, this lady, you know, had two hospital admissions, high dose IV steroids. She had to have a port put in for plasma exchange and IVIG. And we did all these um, tests and treatments that were un, in the in retrospect unnecessary. Uh, it'd be nice if if these commercial tests would be a little bit quicker um, uh, in turnaround. Uh, and I think that's all I had about this. Yeah, that's it. Dr. Warner. Oh, oh, I did, did not remember that. Okay. So, so for our home audience, uh, Dr. Warner was pointing out that disulfiram is used for alcohol abuse uh, prevention, uh, can't be a trigger. And uh, off the top of my head, like amiodarone uh, is also a mitochondrial toxin, although I've not seen any specification for it. Dr. Dickery. Yeah, so um, in, in Europe, uh, treatment has been idinibinone, and idinibinone is the only treatment that we know of right now for labors. In this country, to get it, you have to do, you have to go online and buy it online. Dr. Degree is uh, pointing out that idinibinone is the only uh, effective therapy. It's, it's more popular in Europe than it is here. Uh, you can Perfect online, and that's actually what my patient did. She's taking idenone. Idenone is a coenzyme Q10 analog, and it's thought to support ATP production in the mitochondria. And but it's really in some people it seems like it makes them better, and other people it doesn't do anything. It's not clear if that's a natural history of the disease. So some people do spontaneously get better with labor spiritually, but, uh, but she is taking idenone. Is that Dr. Stag? Yeah. Yeah, you know, as a glaucoma person, this is like super stressful. <laughs> Cases <laughs> like this, this is like what we hate to see, you know, because uh, glaucoma is really like a diagnosis of exclusion in the end for us. And so, especially these normal tension cases are so hard. And uh, so I just was thinking for the residents, maybe like I have, so I have a bunch of questions about it, but one like thinking through what made us feel confident that this isn't glaucoma. So the early acuity loss, but you can get that, but then it was really progressive, right? It went from like... Yeah, so Dr. for the home audience, this, Dr. Stagg is pointing out that, you know, this, uh, these kinds of cases are also a source of heartburn for glaucoma specialists because low tension glaucoma, especially is a diagnosis of exclusion. And the, the thing that really tipped Dr. Zabriskie and I off was that OCT where her optic nerve was swelling. And, you know, with, with labors, you can get swelling of the optic nerve as part of the disease pathogenesis. It's mild. Um, but I think that's what tipped us off to the fact that there was something on top of what appeared to be low tension glaucoma. 
Was the swelling there from the very beginning or was that? No, I will show you. Although you could argue that there was pseudo normalization of that optic nerve initially, because I mean, it looked terrible, but the OCT was normal. Which is or almost normal, which kind of makes you think. Oh, really? But the swelling in, in the presence of thinning can be really uh... like that. Like there, you know, you could look over at the left hand side there. I can't tell. I think that might be superior, but you know, there shouldn't be anywhere in that nerve based on just the picture. Right, right. Where it's coming out as normal. So in retrospect, you could sort of say, well, maybe that what maybe it really was a little bit swollen. Yeah, my. Uh... <laughs> It's too nice. Yeah, so if you look right here at this, um, uh, I think it was the superior temporal area or, or maybe the nasal inferior area, but if you just just kind of keep, hang, keep that in your head. And also, if you look at the, um, like the, the, just the scan of her retinal nerve fiber layer here, and then I'm gonna go down to the slide where she came back into norm. And you can see that that area is definitely I mean, there's no question there's swelling going on here now. So uh, I think in this case, it was a little more dramatic. I mean, that's really what tipped us off. Right, yeah, really interesting case. And then, um, you know, one question is what to do with her eye pressure going forward too. Yes. Yeah. And that's, you know, just from a glaucoma side, that's like what we'd worry about. Cause I, I think she probably has normal tension glaucoma too. And yes. then do we need to keep like the, you know, get single digits pressure just for the sake of that. So, I mean, that's, that's not her case to know what to do going forward. Yeah, you know what she, you know, because she was so, you know, um, well, she asked for a second opinion and I sent her to uh, Alfredo Sadoon, who's like a labor uh, maiden at uh, USC. And he agreed with the diagnosis, uh, but he actually didn't want her pressure to be in the single digits, which is where we had put her. He felt like that, uh, like there's some controversy about, you know, the, about it not being just a matter of intraocular pressure, but the uh, mismatch between intracranial and intraocular pressure. And he wanted her more like around 10, 11, 12. He felt that having her pressure super low like that could encourage swelling of the optic nerve, maybe cause her labors to progress, but it's, 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 it's a big hand waving her. Yeah, so well, I, I'm not going to do not here with the labor and drop the pressure. I'm just going to go afraid of this. It's nice to have someone to say that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and this will go to Dr. Warner. One other thing, I think that I think that we can all recognize labors often in retrospect when it happens in the classic situation. Yes. But I don't think we have good ways of recognizing labors when it's presenting really atypically like this. I mean, it just doesn't spring to your head immediately. And I also think that the clinical features of these labors plus maybe or labors weird are well described. So I think it's entirely possible that the slowly progressive optic neuropathy that she had before, which manifests by her severe cupping, that could also be a, rep, a, a manifestation of labors. We just don't we just don't know it and recognize it yet. Which brings us to Swap, who's going to be coming up later with some very interesting questions. Yes, uh, for the home audience, Dr. Warner was just pointing out that, you know, these atypical cases like the ones that happen in women or that happen later in life, but when there's no environmental trigger, can have, may, may not have the typical clinical features that we're accustomed to, like, um, uh, uh, like the demographics, but also like the visual fields affecting the optic nerve appearance. And it's possible that her optic nerve cupping is just another man atypical manifestation of labors and not low technical. I'm actually not sure how we'll ever uh, know the difference. There is in one study I did see where they took like a, I can't remember like a handful of patients with low tension glaucoma and tested them all for labors mutations and they all came up normal. You know for what it's worth. Dr. There Stein. are cases that have glaucoma and labors. There are, yes, there are cases where patients have both glaucoma and labors, and it's not clear if the uh, labors mutation has anything to do with their glaucoma. Dr. Stagg, I got another comment. Yeah, sorry, one more question. Um, so I'm just thinking of other, other things on the differential, and 
like a CNS lymphoma or something, would that have shown up on the MRI? Or would you, is that, I'm, I'm trying to think, would you need like a, did you do a lumbar puncture? Or were you worried about anything with that, with the, like the, the nerve swelling like that? Yeah, so Dr. Stagg is asking if CNS lymphoma would be on the differential, you know, optic, an optic, you know, an acute on chronic optic neuropathy. And uh, off the top of my head, I'm, I'm almost like we did worry about that. It doesn't always show up on an MRI. And I'm almost certain that we did a spinal tap during our second admission. Pretty sure, because we were just, you know, so desperate. Yes. Uh, I see it. It's the glock. Maybe you did the glaucoma module premium edition. Did you get the ganglion cell layer of that? Did, did you get an image of that? That might be interesting <clears throat> to see if it looks in a classic glaucoma disc pattern. Right. Uh, um, I'm not. I don't. That would be fun yeah. to, I'm, to look at. I'm guessing that Norm did order to hang with us all there. It's probably in there. That'd be, you have to sometimes pull out that report. Yeah. So it might be really good to look at that. And then okay. um, how is she doing? That was the other. Uh, she's stable. She's about uh, count fingers in the right eye at 20, 100. And the left eye, her pressures are good. And her feelings, then she's not, she hasn't progressed. She's still so, practicing. No, I don't think she'll be. Able, she's a uh, well. I, I don't want to say too much. That it would be like PHI, but I guess we're on a contained room. She's a neonatologist. I don't think she'll be able to do that anymore. Very procedure oriented specialty. So I, I think I encouraged her to, to retire. <laughs> okay, this is a good segue into Dr. Vigunta's presentation about glaucoma. <laughs> Yeah, right. Susan and I are sitting on the edge of our seats. Right? <laughs> I found the cure. All right. So I, I um, you know, this started about uh, seven, eight weeks ago, and um, every case I see, I'm just like, am I right? Do I get it right? So there's a lot of things that have me on the edge of my seat, but I figured like this would be. Um, interesting topic to talk about is segueing from Dr. Katz's topic about, you know, was this glaucoma, was this not glaucoma when you see pretty severe optic neuropathy in patients. And so this topic came up when we were discussing in our uh, morning meeting about how we do get referrals in neuro-ophthalmology um, uh, regarding like end-stage glaucoma possibly that continues to progress or is difficult to treat or has quickly progressed in one eye. And we wonder, is this just glaucoma or is there something else going on in addition to glaucoma that's causing um, non-glaucomatous optic atrophy. So when we have a patient who presents like this, when we have this end stage sort of very severe uh, atrophy of both eyes, um, and this is our uh, Brooks membrane uh, minimum rim width scan here showing pretty severe atrophy in both eyes. Um, and you have this peripapillary atrophy, this nasalization of the vessels, but then this patient, you know, is, is referred from glaucoma because maybe they're not responding to treatment in the way that we usually expect. We're not sure if they should be, uh, if we should consider surgery for them. Maybe they have some neurological symptom that they're also presenting with this time around. Uh, so then they're referred over to neuro-ophthalmology and then that's what this presentation is about. What kind of workup do we do? And what is the pathophysiology maybe of this cupping versus uh, pallor that we see? So, <clears throat> Uh, the question is that we came up with in our in our meeting in, in the morning, our usual morning meeting is, should we have some sort of protocol for these referrals? Because they do seem to come in regularly. Um, this is just a picture from Dr. Vigri's book, which I thought was really cool. Um, so we have protocols in our ophthalmology because we love protocols. We have a CRAO protocol, we have an IIH protocol. There's a newer one that's been uh, released since I was last year, which was uh, trying to figure out the difference between uh, optic nerve hypoplasia in some patients and pediatric patients versus optic atrophy. So maybe we can come up with something that helps streamline this process for these patients as well. Um, we ultimately wanna know for these patients, do we have the diagnosis correctly? Are we missing something? And how can we preserve their vision, right? What is the proper intervention also? And there's also this thing lingering in some people's you know, minds in the back where uh, is there, are there medical legal issues of missing a diagnosis, right? So in this 15 year study that was published in 2013 is a UK study, but the largest mean payout, so the largest payouts for medical legal insurance claims was due to poorly followed intracranial tumors um, uh, that were causing visual field changes. Um, I mean, the largest chunk of payouts were still due to like retinal or maybe cataract surgery issues, things like that, but individual payouts, this was the largest group. 
And there's also the possibility to think about when you know, these patients are referred is, is there more than one pathophysiology going on here? So is there normal tension glaucoma and labor, so for example, or is there, or are those on the same spectrum? So it's clear for us, you know, in generally in our general thinking and our, and our teaching that non-glaucomatous issues usually present with like pallor. Usually they're younger patients who have, you know, maybe uh, uh, poor acuity centrally, poor color vision. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have the glaucoma patients who have clear cupping, maybe their older age, they have preserved acuity, that's more, they have some asymmetric cup to disc disease, things like that. But there's all these patients in between that we don't always know uh, if there's more than one pathophysiology of their disease or if there's something else going on neurologically that's causing non-glaucomatous optic atrophy. And the differential for what we look, look at is pretty broad, right, for non-glaucomatous optic atrophy. So we think about ischemic causes, and this is you know, more acute changes that we see, or in radiation, more chronic changes. Uh, retinal disease, when patients present with severe retinal disease because of um, uh, ischemia to the retina or choroid, uh, can eventually lead to optic nerve pallor and optic atrophy. Of course, there's demelanating issues, uveitic causes, retinal dystrophies inherited ones themselves can result in optic atrophy. Um, infectious causes, infiltrative, so we do like uh, CSF studies to look for this as well in imaging. There's compressive issues, and of course, trauma, nutritional, toxic. We've talked about a couple of like medicines already that are um, more like susceptible to affecting the mitochondrial function. Um, and there's a long list of toxic issue, uh, toxic medicines that can result in optic atrophy. Genetic causes, of course, we don't, we always kind of keep that at the end of our list because we want to make sure we rule out all these other things that can um, are probably easier or, or possibly things where we can actually intervene, but we don't want to forget about genetic causes. And of course, there's always, I, I always think about congenital as well, um, because these patients sometimes they're always this way, have always been this way, but they're just interacting with the medical care system for the first time. And someone's like, oh, that's pathology when it um, has always been that way for them. So you have a lot of clues. So of course, you know, a glaucoma, uh, initial visit is very extensive and neuro-ophthalmology visit is very extensive, but we ask different questions usually. So the history is a little bit different, the examination, whether what we do next as far as testing is different. So um, one thing, I mean, I saw most of the, I saw patients with, who were referred for this uh, issue mostly as a resident and a neuro fellow. So I haven't had personally like any um, referrals sent to me yet, but I've you know, reviewed about four cases that were sent to me from um, the, our neuro-ophthalmology attendants. So history of vision loss, it's important to ask if there's been any sudden or painful vision loss, that can be a clue. Any associated neurological symptoms, of course, that can be a clue as well. Um, especially when you're thinking about any sort of like spinocerebellar uh, ataxia, things like that, you might wanna think of that as well. Other cranial neuropathies help uh, to figure out if there's maybe localized lesion somewhere else. Um, digging into their vascular risk factors is important. Looking into family history, personal history of autoimmune diseases, uh, anemia or surgery with history of hypotension can lead to like a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, bariatric surgery, something that I don't always remember to ask about, but as I was making this list, I was like, if you remember to ask about this because of, again, nutritional issues and deficiencies or poor absorption, um, radi any history of radiation because delayed, ra delayed optic neuropathy can present even, of course, like years, two, three years after radiation exposure to the head, um, trauma and infection as well. So um, these are just, again, more things we ask about. So in, the me in medications, we do a very extensive review of their medications. So when I have a patient coming in with disc swelling or atrophy, I'm not quite sure I have the diagnosis. I literally have to do PubMed searches of every single one of their medications they're on just to make sure there hasn't been something reported or an association with optic atrophy because there's just, that list is just so extensive. Um, social history is important as well. Um, I sometimes ask, sometimes our patients also are from, from the boonies or um, other remote, beautiful areas around here. So they, are, they have exposure to well water. So it's important to ask about that. Um, and then family history of color vision loss and other ocular diseases or autoimmune diseases can be helpful. So we know that cupping is obviously associated with glaucoma, but there are many exceptions to cupping being associated with other types of non-glaucomatous optic atrophy, including labors that is on the list and um, compressive optic neuropathies. So like meningiomas can sometimes cause cupping um, in addition to pallor. Uh, for some reason, we don't know exactly why, and I'm 
someone else had another thought here to explain. Um, arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy rather than non-arteritic seems to cause cupping um, uh, more often. Uh, and then congenital optic disc anomalies are important to keep in mind. So does this patient already have some cupping at baseline and then now they have an optic neuropathy, something to consider. Um, dominant optic atrophy as well can, can present with cupping. And then this is a picture right here of methanol poisoning. So this is a pretty severe like uh, cupping that you're seeing here in addition to pallor. You can really see that lamina really nicely. So we know why pallor happens. And um, this is again from Dr. Degree's book. I just put a picture of her front page, front, uh, page here instead of putting the citation. But I think it's a really nice picture of what why we see a pink optic nerve um, initially, which is, you know, as you see in this picture, this is a normal optic nerve up here with the nerve fiber layer and the vessels, when light is shine on them, they just appear pink. And then as there is death of the nerve fiber layer, uh, that area is replaced with these astrocytes and glial cells that actually are opaque. So you have that white reflective um, appearance of the nerve rather, or opaque appearance of the nerve rather than um, a nice pink color. But do we really know why cupping happens, especially since there are so many different pathophysiologies of, why, of, of patients ending up with cupping? Um, you know, the theory is when, when someone has high pressures, we think maybe that intraocular pressure is compressing the posterior ciliary arteries, especially at the lamina. And maybe there are some connective tissue issues where, um, you know, which is why we measure like corneal hysteresis, uh, but don't really know exactly why cupping happens, um, especially when there's normal intraocular pressure. Um, in the, uh, in we're looking at the optic nerve when these patients present, there are many features that we typically learn that are related to uh, glaucoma, essentially. So we look at uh, the nerve fiber layer defect, the pattern of the nerve fiber layer defects. We know that um, when we're looking at the neuroretinal rim, that's probably the most useful area to look at and the most um, specific area that's affected in glaucoma. So obliteration of that rim is very specific for glaucoma. Um, thinning is not as specific, but still important. We see that typical nasalization of the blood vessels, that long, um, uh, vertical cup and the backward bowing of the lamina. And then of course, asymmetry in the cup to disc is something we're taught early on, hemorrhages at the disc, small hemorrhages usually, and that uh, peripapillary atrophy that we also see like in, in myopic eyes as well. Um, the visual fields um, are also of course very helpful. So again, the classic teaching is that we see in non-glaucomatous optic atrophy, um, or in non-glaucomatous visual field defects that there is like these visual field defects that are approaching the vertical midline. And especially if there's something homonymous, of course, we wanna do some imaging to look into that. Um, altitudinal defects, so like we see in NAION um, are also more typical of non-glaucomatous. Having an enlarged blind spot, a central scotoma or a secocentral scotoma, um, having severe loss of color vision in one eye, especially, and then a more significant pupillary defect afferent pupillary defect in one eye is also more of a clue. But even as you know, in glaucoma, there can be asymmetric um, RNFL loss and afferent pupillary defects. So in glaucoma, we feel that like the RNFL is preserved at the papillomacular bundle, whereas in non-glaucomatous or direct um, uh, like mitochondrial issues with the optic nerve, uh, we see the papillomacular bundle, which is a high energy use area uh, is often affected causing those like sequ sequocentral and central scotoma. So now I wanna move into, okay, what do we know that's new? What, what, what are some new clues that can help us with the diagnosis? Um, this isn't necessarily like mind blowing by any means, but this is what's been published recently. So um, there's, it's always fun to look at how, how new tools can help us, right? So we have these book, this Brooks membrane opening, minimum rim width scan that actually Dr. Stagg introduced me to when I was a, a PGUI4. And um, we started using it in, uh, in neuro-ophthalmology as well. Uh, so when someone has a very, very thin neuroretinal rim or when they have myopic eyes and it's hard to tell, like, you know, is there a significant atrophy or um, is there a preserved rim? It helps to get this scan. And there have been studies comparing what does that rim look like when we do a ratio of the rim thickness to generalize like peripapillary RNFL thickness. We do that ratio, we find that the rim of course is as I was saying, more preserved in patients with non-glaucomatous optic atrophy, like an NAION. And it is thinner in patients with like normal tension glaucoma. So I'm gonna show you a picture of that. And then the other thing I'll talk about is uh, OCTA um, as well. 
So in this study that was published in the Neuroophthalmology Journal back in, um, back in 2020, uh, they looked at, I had edited this image so it's just a little easier to, to follow here. So we have uh, in this column, Brooks membrane minimum rim, min, rim width reduction, and then the peripapillary uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness reduction, and the patterns that they each had in NAION and open angle glaucoma. So in these patients, there was a pattern to where the, where the thinning occurred, and it was a similar. It was similar in their uh, rim and in their peripapillary RNFL. So as we expect in in glaucoma, superior and inferior thinning, and then in NAION, a little bit more of a maybe a little altitudinal, like it's more in the superior, and then a little bit nasal as well. When we see this, these are these were really helpful graphs I felt from that from that article where they uh, compared. Again, um, this is here. Sorry, you can't see it over there. Let me move this over. But this is a GMRW, meaning the global minimum rim width. So when they looked at the global minimum rim width for NAION patients, we'll just compare this section with the open angle glaucoma. This is compressive optic neuropathy, which was they felt like was not as useful of a measure. So we're going to ignore that for right now. But the minimum rim width was preserved in the NAION patients, where it was significantly like more lost in the open angle glaucoma patients. And when you look at their peripapillary RNFL thickness, um, there's quite a bit of thinning of the RNFL thickness, and again, thinning uh, in open angle glaucoma and NAION. So you can see the ratio here would be different, where um, the minimum rim width is higher and preserved in NAION compared to open angle glaucoma. So that's a very important area for us to look at. And this is an example case from um, one of my colleagues. So this is a patient who was referred for, do they have glaucoma? Um, or something on top of glaucoma that's also causing their um, optic atrophy. In this scan, uh, this is their minimum rim width scan, and this is their uh, RNFL thickness. And you can see again, just by the colors, just want to just generally give you a, an idea, um, quite a bit of thinning of the RNF of the minimum rim width, more in comparison to the RNFL possible here. So it's just one example case. Another study looking at OCTA, um, they uh, uh, these. Uh, investigators looked at uh, the, the choroidal um, microvasculature right around the optic nerve. And so in this picture, I want you to try to focus in on this area. It's, it was hard to see. I had to zoom in pretty uh, a lot when I was trying to look at this. But they're highlighting in this picture that in a patient, this is the top column is an NAION patient. The bottom column is a normal tension glaucoma patient. Sorry, uh, bottom row. Um, this right here is outlined in the red is showing that there is some uh, choroidal microvasculature thinning here on OCTA more in the NAION patient more so that than there is in the normal tension glaucoma patient. So, you know, they looked at just a small sample size overall, but they thought that that was um, significant in this study. But um, you know, it's not a slam dunk always. These are just studies that look that didn't necessarily, and it, the problem with both of these studies is that they didn't um, uh, have a control for like how severe is the, was the glaucoma in the patients with, with glaucoma. So um, a lot of variability there still. Um, so once we've looked at the optic nerve in detail, then we think about, okay, looked at the history, the optic nerve in detail, what other testing can we do? There is a lot of potential testing you can do in neuroophthalmology, so it's important to try to to try to focus it and not put the patient, you know, drain them of all their blood and CSF. But um, the things to look at are if there's any symptoms like related to infection, autoimmune, uh, uh, serum protein electrophoresis, um, vitamin levels, especially like even um, we think about vitamin A and vitamin E, B12, B6, but also niacin has been associated with optic atrophy heavy metals, we can test for perineoplastic antibodies. Again, that's like something that is worth testing in someone who um, fits the right demographic, a little bit older, maybe may or may not have a history of cancer, but we're concerned about it. We can do you know, evaluation by uh, scanning um, the appropriate area, sending them for um, appropriate cancer screening. And if there's still, if there isn't another cause that we're finding, it's worthwhile uh, testing for perineoplastic antibodies in these patients. Um, lumbar puncture can also be used to test for multiple things, including cytology and cytometry, especially if we're thinking this patient might have an infiltrative lesion like multiple myeloma or uh, lymphoma leukemia. And of course, I want to talk about genetic testing briefly. This is one of the last things I'll touch on. Um, I talked to Emily Spoth, our genetic counselor, about how she recommends that we approach this. And 
Um, she always has great different, like different tricks and tools to help make the testing more affordable for patients. So one of the things that she, she suggested is that if there's no paternal inheritance of uh, vision loss, as far as we know, then a great place to start is with the SPARC retinal dystrophy panel. So as you know, it's like a 330 gene panel that is free until about January, uh, 2023. Um, and it includes some um, uh, optic atrophy genes or genes that have been associated with it. And if that comes back negative, then for free, we can add on with Invite testing, we can add on additional, like an additional optic atrophy panel. So that's a great little trick that she's found. Um, if there is a possible paternal inheritance or we don't really know, and we're interested in looking at mitochondrial inheritance, then Blueprints Genetics uh, Optic Atrophy Panel covers 76 genes that, that can um, maybe capture uh, labors and other mitochondrial issues, dystrophies. Um, and then there's also Blueprints also has a, a neuro-ophthalmology panel as well. It covers even more genes. So considering, again, back to the idea of maybe a protocol, it's, as you can see, there's quite a variety of things we have to try to cover for our patients if we're thinking about why could they be developing some non-glaucoma optic atrophy. But oftentimes we can find like, maybe they were referred for a particular reason and we can dive into that history, of, uh, get those relevant labs. And then um, the neuro-ophthalmology referral always helps to kind of piece everything together, spend the extra time needed to, to coordinate all that testing and, and lab work. Um, I think that's where I'm gonna end right now, but any questions or any thoughts on, um, yeah, back to that. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think a protocol is a great idea. We should maybe talk more about it, but the, I, these are really, really stressful cases for us. The, and there, there is a lot of normal tension glaucoma. I think maybe in a way there didn't used to be, but uh, like we see a lot of normal tension glaucoma and it's, a lot of it's really severe. And so uh, yeah, coming up with some sort of protocol or, or the best way to handle it. Cause a lot of times our question, what's stressful with normal tension patients is a lot of times our question is whether or not to do a big surgery like a trabeculectomy or, or something else. And so, uh, you know, and those are like risky surgeries. And so there's, we don't want to do it for someone who doesn't need a, um, so yeah, I think that'd be really helpful. Absolutely, yeah. Um, love to, I'd love to talk about that too. And we can, I can discuss with you and bring it back to our neuropathy team and get some ideas together. Could be a great QI project for somebody. <laughs> Want you to work with me? <laughs> All right, well, um, I'll step down and then uh, Dr. C is next. So this is going to be just a quick update on an upcoming clinical trial that we're going to be participating called the IAH Evolve trial. So as most of you know, IAH has significant morbidity, uh, reduced quality of life from both the headache and vision standpoint. We've got to see this all the way, which does have evidence for it, but can be quite intolerable. People get the nummies and tinglies, um, some loose stool. So some people end up not taking it and um, not good for their IH. We, you know, we have surgeries, but we reserve this for people with severe vision loss due to complications, high failure rate. So bottom line is we need better treatments for IH. And I know you all are wondering, why aren't we using these gut neuropeptides to treat IH? Um, well, we are. So the GLP-1, which is glucagon-like peptide one, is known to stimulate insulin release helps control glucose in patients with diabetes, also helps weight and appetite control, which is very important for IH. However, it's also believed to act on the choroid plexus to reduce DSF secretion, hence lowering ICP. So potentially many benefits from this medication for patients with IH. So exenatide is an example of a GLP-1 receptor agonist medication, has been shown to lead to weight loss in patients uh, either with or without diabetes. It's actually been around since 2005, so we have a lot of experience knowing its safety profile. 
Um, Prasindan is a formulation of exenatide that's been developed for IAH. It's different because it's extended release, which creates a lot of more convenience with dosing. And that's why Prasindan is gonna be used in this um, uh, trial, which is going to uh, assess the efficacy and safety of Prasindan in IAH. So the primary objective of the study is really looking at intracranial pressure <clears throat> after 24 weeks of being on this medication. However, there's many secondary objectives such as Humphrey visual field, mean deviation, the degree of their optic disc edema is measured by OCT, their headaches, their acuity, and then how many patients have treatment failure. So this is a randomized placebo-controlled double-blind multicenter trial. Goal is to enroll 240 patients with IAH and they'll be split into placebo versus those uh, receiving persendin. Uh, goes for 24 weeks and then the outcomes are measured. Inclusion of patients, so these are adults over 18. These are newly diagnosed IAH patients and they have to come in within four weeks of their screening lumbar puncture. They've got to have bilateral optic disc edema. And importantly, this is mild IAH because you'll know that there's that placebo controlled arm. So we don't want people losing vision on placebo. Um, they've got to have headaches and then not be, preg uh, not be pregnant. <clears throat> Some exclusion, so they can't have secondary causes of elevator pressure like masses or uh, venous venous thromboses. Um, and then they have to not have been on treatment to lower their pressure within a week of screening can't have any other ocular diseases, and they can't be on any other glucose-lowering medications since this is a glucose-lowering medication. And they have to be able to perform sub subcutaneous injections because this is a once-weekly injection that they do themselves or someone else does for them. So very brief highlight, but not yet enrolling, <clears throat> not exactly sure when, but in the next coming I mean, months, hopefully. Um, questions about this? Dr. Warner. Yeah, I'd have to, right. Yeah, yeah I need to, uh, so the question is, how many of our patients kind of on medications? Um, can they be stopped for a week and then enrolled? I do need to double check that. But the exclusion criteria does say within a week of our lumbar puncture sign. I think yes, but I double check. Yes. I'm not, super, I'm not very familiar with these medications, but they're, are they the ones that are also being used for weight loss? Yes. yes. The question was, are these medications being used for weight loss? Yes, are these being used for diabetes or weight loss in general? <clears throat> but like I said, there are animal studies that show that they lower ICP, so potentially are, are very beneficial for IH. From a patient report, it said they, they said that their doctor was uh, trying to get it approved for weight loss. And uh, so I think that by inference, they're quite expensive and the insurance companies are not psyched about use being them being used for weight loss. So they they create sort of burden, burdens of, of uh, criteria yeah. in order to my friend who's a pharmacist has said there's like a huge black market almost for these. <laughs> these they're like, you know, it's like more than opioids, people are like forging prescriptions for them now. Forging prescriptions. Wow. For those lying the gossip, there's um, due to insurance problems for weight loss, uh obtaining these for weight loss alone, apparently there's a black market for these. So be on the <laughs> A question in the chat. So the <clears throat> question is why did they decide to do placebo control rather than non-inferiority compared to IH? Uh, I think that's compared to C Um so they I don't recall the exact reason for why they're not comparing to see those I think it is want to see if it's working for IH, but it was felt to be safe to have a placebo-controlled arm because this is mild IH, just like uh, the IH treatment trial. 
had a treatment arm and then a placebo arm, and that was mild by age. So we do have the option of treating patients' headaches in the placebo-controlled arms uh, with any migraine medication, or if they start to deteriorate, we obviously take them out of the trial and treat them as we normally would. 